Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Living with Parkinson's Meetup. I'm Chris Kruger, Program Manager for Educational Content with the Davis Finney Foundation. And like the panelists on the screen today, I too live with Parkinson's. I was diagnosed in 2020. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here uh, to have another session with uh, with the members of the audience and the meetup group. So uh, thanks for being here. And before we start talking about our topic today, which is uh, different ways that Parkinson's influences love in our lives. But uh, so I wanted to comment a little bit on something you may have noticed in our December meetup, which is that uh, you know, Heather Kennedy, uh, our friend and longtime panelist, announced that she was going to step away from the meetup. And, um, you know, I didn't comment on it then, but I just want to say a little bit about it now because I think it's important. Uh, the main factor in Heather's stepping away from the meetup is that she wanted to rethink how she used her energy and find some new creative pursuits. Um, so I wanted to just say that in addition to being a part of this meetup uh, and other important Davis Finney Foundation content for many years, Heather's been super helpful and generous sharing her time, her humor, her insights and her advice with so many people around the world who live with Parkinson's, including me. And um, so it's, you know, it was really great to be able to spend that time with her. And I'm excited to see what kind of good trouble Heather gets into in the future. <laughs> and uh, some of that is gonna involve uh, other projects with the foundation. Um, and so I'm excited to, to be involved in those with her. And, um, you know, I'm just excited to see what kind of hijinks she gets into. And we'll, we'll put some links in the chat so you can keep an eye on what Heather's doing and we'll, we'll connect, we'll give you ways to connect with her social media and her website and all that. So that'll go in the chat. And um, yeah, I just want to say thanks to Heather for, for her time and her contributions. And um, we'll see, we'll see her on the other side, flipping around in new projects, excited to see what comes of it. So uh, while I'm sad personally to, to share that news, I'm also really glad to be here with the people that are on this panel. And so I want to excite, uh, ask everyone to please just go ahead and introduce yourselves and say where you're coming from, where you're calling in from. And uh, maybe since our topic is love today, maybe a quick answer about whether it's made it, whether Parkinson's has had a helpful influence, a detrimental influence, or just a neutral, it hasn't really changed your experience of love in the world. Um, and why don't we start with uh, with Kat? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm calling in today from Desert Hot Springs in Southern California. We are back in our um, airstream for our final month of travel. Um, let's see. I I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in twenty <laughs> year twenty fifteen at the age of forty eight. So I'm older now. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to do math. Um, and, and I, I think um, Parkinson's, I've been married for almost 34 years to the same man. And um, uh, I, I will say that Parkinson's has given us pause at times and some opportunities to learn how to better communicate with one another. Um, and sometimes also lends itself to um, communicating in, in new ways about intimacy and about love and about sex. So I'll leave it there and I'll pass it along. Uh, how about you, Amber? I love Amber's red sweater today. So. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Amber. I am calling in from El Paso, Texas. I am, I'm old. I'm 40 years old now, but I was diagnosed in 2018 when I was 35. I don't know if that math is right, but it's been a while. <laughs> um, as far as love goes, I have been single since way before my diagnosis and have remained that way. So I can't say that it's impacted my love life, um, but I do feel like it's been a struggle because I feel like I avoid being asked how I'm doing. So. I avoid asking others how they're doing. So that's a number one thing when you care for somebody, you want to take that interest and show how you love them and that you're invested in how they're doing. And I feel like I do avoid that. All right. Thanks, Amber. Uh, Robin, how about, uh, can you, can you give us a, a sense of where you're at and what's sure. up with love? Robin Moravis here calling in from Cincinnati, Ohio, normally out of Charlotte, but I'm in Cincy today. I was diagnosed in 2015 at 48 years old and I thought about this a while, and I would say that Parkinson's in some ways has acted like a great filter 
and it's kind of exchanged old relationships for new, but it's kind of filtered out the bad, the ones that weren't serving me. And it's substituted in, you know, substituted in relationships that are more supportive, more mutual than maybe the ones before. So those are my initial thoughts there. Yeah, I think I have a similar experience that um, I've made some really great new connections because of this, including with the people on this panel. So thanks for thanks for being that part of my life, everybody. Um, and uh, Brian, how about how about you? I see you're you're in a new environment from from where you were last time. So tell us tell us what's going on, where you're at, and a little bit about love. Um, thanks. I'm I'm in uh, Oak Hospital in Newport Beach. I had uh, back surgery a week ago. And it was extremely successful. Uh, they found it was the disc was worse than they thought. So it took an extra hour, but I could immediately feel the benefit when I got out. Um, I'm in a acute care center now, trying to build up strength to go home. I get I get released Monday. So um, yeah. and uh, Parkinson's and love, um, you know it it would be weird to say it became a gift but it brought when i still had my lily before she passed away three years ago we had a lot of challenges with parkinson's and that brought us to better communication you know initially when i had word finding challenges she would just initially pop in the word and i said no i need you to give me time and that kind of thing that dialogue and exchange on things and then go to support groups and understanding future challenges. Um, it grew our love beyond measure uh, and appreciation for each other. And then that helped me be there for her when she got cancer and then it went metastatic. So I think it's really um, an opportunity uh, to, to make or break a relationship and it can more make it if you both have the tenacity to do the work and put into it. Uh, that's yeah, my thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. And I'm so glad to hear that the surgery was successful. It's that's really great. Yeah. That's that's something to love today, right? I mean, that's a great exactly piece of, uh, exactly great thing for today. Uh, so, uh, Christy, I think uh, why don't you tell us where you're at and a little bit about what's going on for love with you? Hey, everybody. I'm Christy Monica. I'm from Troy. I'm in Troy, New York. Um, so my husband and I have been married for, I think, 15 years. We've been together since like 1986, so for a really long time. Um, I don't, I think it's kind of neutral with us. We're still navigating how to communicate. Um, it's really still difficult for us to communicate. Um, so we're still navigating all that. So he, he hasn't really accepted my Parkinson's diagnosis as much as I have. Um, so we're still working on that. But it's a work in progress so hopefully sometime soon we'll get there to talking more and communicating better so yeah i, under I understand that and um i i don't want to i don't want to trivialize what you just said but i want to add one other thing i love about what's happening on the screen it's that i love the purple hair i do too i was <laughs> dying to say that it's yeah. the best yeah. color yet wait for the next one the next one's going to be ombre with pink and purple and so just in case, uh, just in case people aren't up on it, let's just share the, yeah. share what's going on since you so got I'm the DBS in May. And so I figured I might as well, if I'm going to have to shave my head or have my head shaved, I might as well make it fun. And this is the one time that I can, that I'll bleach it. No problem. Cause I'm going to lose it. It doesn't matter if I destroy it. Whereas when it's normal, when I like have my hair, I like, I wouldn't typically bleach it other than this. Cause I'm going to have to shave it. So and I've donated it like multiple times already, so that's not even an issue. I've given enough hair away. Well, I love I love the energy and the spirit of that. So uh, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing the next the next color. Um, so, like I've said, uh, you know, and like we've been talking about, our topic today is love, and you know, this is sort of inspired by Valentine's Day, but it's also you know we don't have to stick stay on romantic love. There's other types of love. There's the love for children or, or family members, there's love of humankind, there's love of animals, things, love of oneself, love of God, and maybe there's others that we could talk about too. But just to give a quick um, intro, you know, I don't want to try to define love. I'm not going to go that, that far. But I do think that it's worth noting that some people think about love in terms of nouns, the object that you love. Other people think about it as a verb. 
It's a thing you do. And, um, you know, I think Parkinson's can affect all, all aspects of love. And, um, you know, one thing we have to do is, is love ourselves. I think that's a, that's a core human um, experience that it's a challenge maybe to do sometimes. And I'm wondering how Parkinson's has affected, just as an opening question here, how Parkinson's has affected our ability to love ourselves. And I'm wondering what the panelists think about that. Well, I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, I, I think that that I, I just I'm reading some notes in the chat and about it's it's hard to think of Parkinson's bringing anything but suffering. That's I want to honor that that um, that it does bring suffering. And I think the challenge for me has been to learn that everybody everybody on earth is going to have suffering of some kind. And how do we, as a, as a human being, get out of that suffering and get to a place of, you can call it love, you can call it joy, you can call it awe. And, and, and what I'm, I'm getting at is that we all have to work at that. You know, whether you have Parkinson's or whether you have cancer or whether you have diabetes or one can get really lost in that and I think the work and the richness is when you learn that you in order to survive and move forward you have to find some of that other stuff and it the more you suffer the harder you have to work at it and I I don't mean to be trite with that because it's hard work. It can be really hard, but it it also can be rewarding. And, you know, Robin, I, I really loved what you shared about kind of Parkinson's giving you the opportunity to weed out what maybe wasn't good and authentic and rich in your life and choosing to go a different direction. And maybe maybe some of those opportunities are invitations, but um but it's work and i think relationships are work and you know not every every minute of our 34 years has been flowers and daisies you know um not just because of my parkinsons but because of life so i know that's really philosophical but we also have to love ourselves and have compassion for ourselves before we can share that with others with our kids with our families, with our dogs. Yeah, Amber, jump in, babe. <laughs> um, as far as like loving myself, I think that I love myself more now with Parkinson's than I did beforehand. And I think it's because of the work that you're talking about. I think because I know how much it takes for me to get up every day and do all the things that you need to do in a day. And so the fact that I'm able to do that or push myself to do that makes me appreciate myself that much more. And to do all the things that I have to do for like my kids or my family, you know, to be an active participant in my life. I feel like if I'm going to work that hard, I'm not going to do it for somebody that I don't love, you know. I would say that I agree. Um, it's hard to explain because it's a bit paradoxical. But as my symptoms progress, I go through an initial stage of self-loathing. But what Parkinson's is forcing me to do is strip away the false sense of identity that I have associated with all of my externals, my ability to speak, my ability to think, my job performance, my, how I appear in public. There are all these different things that I've associated my identity with and my value, if you will. And what Parkinson is, Parkinson's has forced me to do is go beyond and underneath that superficial level. And so it's paradoxical because on one hand, I have greater self-loathing than I ever had. And on the other hand, once I move through it, I have greater self-acceptance, self-compassion and self-love than I've ever had. And so it's kind of, it's, this is a very, the way you posed the questions, um, Chris, were very thought provoking to me. Um, I hadn't really ever thought about it in this way. And so I appreciate the conversation. And it's, you know, it's funny. I think about some of those surveys you take where you say, oh, you, are you embarrassed to be in public? And I'm like, no, why would they even have that question? And I'm like, oh, here's why they would have that question. So, you know, there's questions that didn't used to make sense to me, like, 
the difficulty speaking and things like that that's starting to happen. And um, it is a life opportunity, I'll say that. Christy. Yeah, yeah Christy, let's, what do you got? For the most part, um, I'm happy with myself. And at, anytime I kind of get down on anything, I think about like, I go to work every day. So I have to get myself out of bed every day, like, and do what other people do normally. And I still have to go home and do other things like cook dinner or do laundry. And it's, I'm still doing everything like I normally should, but with Parkinson's. And that's pretty amazing that I can do all that. So some days it's not easy, but I still do all the stuff that I can. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that is great. And, and I think that relates to, to Robin's comment too, just about uh, you know, the opportunity that is presented and then the fact that it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of the every victory counts, uh, message, right? I mean, everything we do is, is a, is a, is a victory and that, that really matters. Uh, Brian, I think you had something. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question you're asking. Um, and it's something I struggle with a lot these days. Um, uh, but I know that, uh, I love myself enough that I want to accomplish a lot of things. It's hard to say that I love myself because I see so many struggles and so many people that have left and I feel responsible for that. Um, but a lot of that comes from people not understanding Parkinson's family and friends they all think Parkinson's is just the shakes. They don't understand that there's the non-motor aspects of the disease and it affects um, depression. And when I started to have suicidal ideations, a lot of my family abandoned uh, because it was too hard to handle. And um, what comes from that, what speaks to that with your question though is, I love myself enough not to do that. So the thoughts come because that's part of Parkinson's. I don't think that because I want to get out. I want to fight having that feeling. I want to fight having that emotion come to me. That shouldn't be there. And and that happened be, be, I had suicidal ideations before Lily died. You know, and I would upset her. It would crush the world. But it only goes there because we lack the dopamine to kind of pull ourselves up stronger. But if we have enough self-love that we don't want to harm ourselves, we seek out help. And so whenever those thoughts get strong, I seek out help. And I think that's one thing that's not addressed enough within the Parkinson's world about the depression and the suicidal ideations. Um, and I've talked about it in the past, but I've never talked about I absolutely do not want to do that. I, I lost three students to suicide my first three years of teaching. And I spent the next 17 years teaching positivity in the face of adversity. And there's always a choice. And as I'm dealing with the struggles that I'm dealing with now, because Parkinson's is inhibiting my recovery. And so I got very emotional today and I, it hit me hard. And um, it struck me that I need to get help from at home and stuff. Thanks for sharing all that, Brian. I mean, it's, uh, you've, I feel you. And I'm so, I'm so glad that you are taking the compassionate approach to yourself that, you know, that, and that's what, what uh, Joe in the chat has drew attention, drawn attention to uh, saying that they've been married for 45 years and, and it's more than sex or physical intimacy for, for them to love each other. It's, it's about commitment, respect, and compassion. And those things are true for, for, loving yourself too, I think, and, uh, or loving to be a, a guitar player, loving to play the guitar. It's a commitment, it's respect, it's compassion, but you're, you're saying this about your own experience navigating these real big challenges you're, you're facing, Brian, and I really respect that. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, thanks for sharing. And, uh, Christy, you're, you got your hand raised. Let, let, let's go to Christy. Thank you, Brian, for sharing. But to add on to what Brian said, I think that we all deserve like a medal or like a trophy every day for just getting up and just leaving our house. I mean, or doing whatever, because the fatigue is so real with Parkinson's 
that it's so hard to do ever anything that like if you accomplish any like get, just getting out of bed i think that's a major achievement for the day and you should be happy with yourself for even doing that i love love yourself for that yeah you have and, to get your door to hand out trophies every day and that acceptance of you know our disease is progressing you know if if we're lucky enough to live a while <laughs> Um, we're probably going to see disease progression. And so it's, it's, it's having grace with a moving target, sort of, you know, right. we all know that, right? And, it, yeah. and, 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 and having grace as a newly diagnosed person is really different than having grace 10 years into it, Robin, which is about where you and I are. Robin and I, uh, are, we have pretty parallel what's going on. You know, right. what used to be embarrassing in public was that I had a little bit of a limp. Now, you know, it's more things like bladder function and there better not be a line or, you know, I mean, there, it, it, it's, it, it's hard work to stay in grace and to have a sense of humor. And um, it, it's hard work. And it, it also comes back to the very core of those human elements. I have a choice right now. <laughs> I can be miserable and humiliated, or I can try to laugh it off and, and be maybe an example. If my kids or my adult kids are there, I have an opportunity to teach them what that might look like because with, with, with any luck, um, hopefully my kids will get to experience old age someday. And, you know, we're all going to get there if we're lucky. Right. So um i love glad, what you said so glad I, to hear you're doing well anyway i'm sorry go ahead robin yeah yeah i love what you said about having grace with the moving target and i wanted to pick up on something you said earlier a lot of people have talked about it this idea of communication um because i very inartfully said something last night that i was trying to explain to my partner this horizon line that i can see that combines apathy with my world getting smaller and it sort of came out like, I just want to be around my house and don't want to be bothered. Like there's not a place for him. And I was just trying to explain this weird world that's evolving for me so that he would understand the context. And I ended up having to write a letter of amends this morning because it really did not go well. And I'm finding that um, a lot of my relationships are being impacted by, I used to be very quick-witted and, and able to just explain things. Part of my job before my current, part of my occupation before my current role in my current job too, is being very good with words, speaking quickly and accurately and getting to the bottom of things. And I find I really can't do that as effectively. And so I might take a shorthand and I, you know, I've got a friend that you know, basically told me to go to hell over a misunderstanding. And I was like, and I was like, God, can't you just give me the benefit of the doubt and ask me, you know, and it's like, it's just, I'm in this process of kind of, it's weird. I think my whole world is in the process of being reshaped right now. And I think with some other friends, I'm in the process of losing them, not like any direct cut tie, but just this, you know, atrophy of communication. And some of that's on me. Um, you know, I could call them up and say, hey, let's go for a bike ride or what are you doing? But there's like this combination of apathy and my world getting smaller. And, you know, it takes a I, lot of energy. Also. Yes. <laughs> it takes an enormous amount of energy. And when we have less and less energy, yeah, we have people in the world that we love and care for deeply. Teaching and and attending to all of those relationships take energy. And, all right. Um. And, and I'm I'm still working. Yeah. And I'm still, and working, still working, and it's like right. all of this energy goes into doing my job. Right. <laughs> there isn't a lot left at the end of the day. Right. And it's confusing for us. And we're in our own bodies experiencing Parkinson's. For those that love us, it's equally challenging. 
-hmm. and they're not in the in our bodies experiencing it rob and i've had the same kinds of interactions um um often with my husband because we spend a lot of time together and in a very small place <laughs> in this little tiny airstream <laughs> so <clears throat> it has led to some challenges because I'm trying to explain something and I'm not doing it well. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm doing it well, but we're missing each other. Larry, uh, Larry Gifford and, and his wife, Becca Gifford and Ken and I did a webinar together talking about intimacy and, and both Larry's Larry has Park, young onset Parkinson's disease and, uh, and I have a, a young onset and our partners both have experienced similar things with us where we're trying to say things and we're not communicating well and it ends up being hurtful. So, so I don't have an answer. I wish that I did. I'm trying to learn to pause before I speak. Let's be honest. That's never been a strength of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. I'm a work in progress. So this actually all points back to something that Jennifer said in the chat a little while ago that uh, Jennifer said, I can think of nothing that Parkinson's has given me other than suffering, especially in relationships. I can't communicate properly. I can't do things and I don't enjoy anything fun. Huh? And that really, I mean, that really sticks with me and it relates to what has just been said. I mean, the communication piece is such a big part of this how do you get things scheduled to do with anybody and how do you know you're going to be able to do it when it comes up so jennifer i just want to say i i hear you and i i, I appreciate your comment and you know it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge as has been just discussed um another thing from the chat that was said that i think we really should maybe talk about is uh, a question that came in that's and this is the question it says insofar as being physical with a person with parkinson's consent is an issue because mental capacities fluctuate and um, uh, what what's your take on it? And I, I think this is a question about sexual intimacy um, being physical, but I think it also relates to situations like if you freeze and somebody and somebody sort of pulls you out of a freeze, that can be a really big problem, not only for physical safety, but it can also be maybe a little bit not what you wanted in a, just an objective sense of your your hopes for your your autonomy. So. Um, I just want to draw attention to the, this idea of how can how do we navigate being physical with people in our lives, given our circumstances? And if anybody has any perspective on that, whether it's physical, sexual intimacy or, or otherwise. Sorry, well, I, I have a I have a story about this. I was just down in Florida last week. Uh, my mom's assisted living. There are three or four people with Parkinson's and. I know what they're experiencing in some ways more than the nursing staff does. And so there was a guy who was frozen and he couldn't get from the dining room to his room. And I said, hey, I know you. I know about you. My mom told me you're new. Hi, I have Parkinson's. Can I give you, can I offer some suggestions? He was like, yes, please. And I just said, you know, sometimes people are able to get out of a freeze if they're touched. Is it okay if I touch you on your back? And he was like, yes. And we talked through getting him walking again. And it was a really, it took us about a half an hour to get, you know, a hundred yards down the hall. And, um, but it's not going to mental consent, but I was able, we were just having a conversation and he said, you've been more helpful than anybody here because, and one of the nurses, I know they mean well, but she came by and she said, oh, so-and-so had that problem. And she just stood upright and she was able to walk again. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and so just being able to, you know, have my hand on his back and let him balance on one leg and swing the other leg and get it going. And then we found that if we took away the walker and he held the windowsill, he could walk until he got to a doorway. And then it would take about 10 minutes to get through a doorway, back to the windowsill, clock it. It was very interesting. But I just ask, is it okay if I do this? I've heard this helps. Can we try it? And he said he found it very encouraging. I also think what a gift, Robin, how, what a gift in the moment to really be seen and understood for somebody. Mm -hmm. That's all mm -hmm. we really want, right? 
you know, and that's why we're all here, I think. Way. Like if you ask someone what the, what you can do for them or how you can help them, if you can help them, I think that goes a long way instead of just doing something for them or just yeah. taking it or doing it, which I, I feel like kind of fits in that category. Well, and he told he told my mom that he had never known that. And so the next time he froze, he asked someone to touch him. <laughs> And it worked. He was able to get unfrozen by doing that. He didn't even know what to ask for. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And I, I think the, um, the physicality aspect of it and how it might be awkward for friends or people were, were getting involved. I think what, what I'm finding is it keeps the quality people close and the people that were I don't know if not as quality is the right way to say it, but it you you get better quality when you see who's there to support you and you you know then that's your base. So it's it's painful to lose people, it's very hard. Um and it keeps happening, but it's I focus on I I, I always say the, the Michael J. Fox quote, you know, Parkinson's is a gift that keeps on taking. Uh and and it it's undefinable, uh, but it's always where I come to is the people that stay with me are the people I trust, and I, that's my quality core. And mm. I let go of the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And letting go is hard. Mm. It's Very hard. hard. It's hard to let go of wanting to have all the energy uh wanting to do all the things wanting to um wanting even to want to do all the things that apathy um which i'm starting to have more of um as i you know navigate this um i try really hard not to judge it um and try to just accept okay this is what the day's like today um it'll be a new day tomorrow and not put a bunch of uh expectations or judgments around it because both of those things take energy just sort of accepting um accepting that i might watch some tv today or accepting that i might not feel really strongly about anything but at least i'll get out and walk the dog because the dog feels strongly about it <laughs> um you know or I, they're I don't the least know. judgmental <laughs> right and they're the least judgmental right he likes me no matter what um and he doesn't care if i haven't brushed my teeth yet <laughs> um but i feel like i do most things because my kids feel very strongly about it not because i do i was gonna ask you amber how that is for you um i I think just like with any parent, you do things that you don't want to do or you don't have energy to do or you don't have time for because that's what your kids want. So I feel like that falls in line with most parents. It's just an extra an extra challenge for somebody with Parkinson's. You know, especially right now, they're both teenagers, so they're both wanting to go with their friends and go to the mall and go here and go there. And so playing chauffeur when I've worked a 40-hour a week and right. I'm have stuff to do at the house and still have to try to fit that in, in between chauffeur trips, you know, mm -hmm. but I feel like most parents struggle with that at some point or another. It's just an extra challenge to deal with. You get an extra trophy or a badge or what did we say, Christine? Trophies. 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 Yeah. I need yeah. them all. <laughs> Giving you lots of extra trophies here. Yay. Mm -hmm. I win. You win. <laughs> yeah. So, so that that actually, I, this is a strange transition I'm about to make, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, do it. You know, talking about the things that we we sort of do for other people, uh, and that that is a part of being a loving human being is 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 being present for other people's interests and being compassionate and respectful of those, and uh, you know, going. We do that for our children. We do that for our 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 parents. Um, we do that for our lovers. We we make decisions on those grounds. And and going back to that, the the sexual intimacy issues. 
that's that's a challenge. And I'm wondering if we might talk a little bit about how do we deal about with apathy if if we experience it relative to sexuality um, and disinterest or or inability to to generate the energy to to pursue that. Um, I don't know how to go forward with that, but I th- we've gotten a couple questions about this uh, from the audience, and I thought we should talk about it if we can. Yeah, Amber. I will say that I'm apathetic about a lot of things, a lot of things. It takes energy for me to breathe sometimes. Sex is not one of the things that I'm apathetic about. But that could be because I'm single, and so it's not something that frequently comes up. Um, but when it does, that, I'm going to jump at the chance. Yeah, and, you know, I think... It's interesting because uh, uh, when I was on the agonists um, briefly, <laughs> um, I there I liked several things about the agonists. It gave me energy. It made me hypersexual, which was uh, safe for me because I had a husband. But it it can be scary, and it was um, it got a little. It could get out of control, and I could see very easily how that would be a really harmful thing for many and for many relationships. And it was a side effect that and um, some compulsive behavior around food that wasn't worth it for me for the side effects. Um, On the flip side, some of that apathy. So then I went off the agonists and it's almost this other, other end of the spectrum. And so I think having discussions with my partner has been really important around that around how we define intimacy because it's not just the acts act of having sex and having an orgasm that is intimate in our relationship those things are important but those things are not always achievable for me anymore being intimate yes having orgasm no um and we talk about it and um and it it, it doesn't need to be taboo. Sexual health is an integral part of our health. And we need to be talking about those things with our healthcare providers. We need to be talking about side effects with medicines. If we can't talk about it, they're not going to talk about it sometimes either. We have to bring it up. Um, oh, and I've asked questions theory. and they've been like, good. Huh? Right. I don't know. <laughs> Right. So as if you don't know, (laughs) I talked a lot about sex and, and, um, and sexual organs and sexual function. It is important. So if you don't get answers from your movement disorder specialist, you can talk about it with your primary also, or go see a midwife. Most health systems have nurse midwives. They'll talk to you about sex. Yeah. Yeah, Just like with menstruation, like who do you actually go to? Like do new specials specials really understand this like or i mean who do you go to I can tell you my I can tell you my neurologist had no help for me in that area at all right. i don't know do you talk to well, an oncologist I, don't, you know. I go to i go to a bioidentical hormone doctor and that addresses those issues for me that's totally hormonally impacted it's not from Parkinson's, at least so far, it hasn't been from Parkinson's. So, um, but it's like, I can tell, I get um, subcutaneous pellets and they about once a quarter. And I can tell almost to the day when it's time to go back because about a week before everything drops off. So that's hormonally related for me. Mm -hmm. Um, So, Many and I, I go to a special doctor for the hormones because my regular OBGYN is not a big fan. So I go to a doctor that I can get the treatment that I want. And I think that brings up the importance of advocating for yourself as a patient, no matter what yeah. setting you're in. Yeah. That's part of loving yourself is loving yourself enough to bring up hard things in the doctor's office. It's loving yourself enough to bring up hard things and hard conversations with the people you care about, whether they're your kids, whether they're your partner, whether they're somebody you're dating. Um, uh, You know, it's hard to be human. (laughs) And but it's okay to be vulnerable. And and your doctors will tell right out if they're going to talk to you about it or not. Right. Right. Amber, like what you said. 
Oh, yeah. He was like, I don't know. I don't have any patients that are menstruating. And then I was like, he's like, I have a, a 28 year old that has Parkinson's. And I was like, well, what did she say? Well, she's a nurse. And I'm like, okay. And well, what did she say about it? Well, I don't know. And I'm like, well, thanks. Ask. That was completely yeah. helpful. We're learning though. And we're trying, um, you know, if anybody is um, interested in getting more involved, there's surveys that you can take on the Michael J. Fox Foundation website. We're trying to learn more about hormones and Parkinson's. But, Parkinson's but, right? but here are, more, yeah, thank you. Christy knows better than I do. I always get it close and then Christy has to help me. It's like 90% of women, regardless of their hormonal status, are not asked by the room specialist about their hormones. That's ridiculous. That's like 90% like, who would you talk to about these issues? Yeah. Because you yeah. can you really expect your gynecologist would know if you're a woman. I don't, I don't think that's fair. Yeah. So and I, men I wanna, too. Go ahead. Yeah, good. Thank I just you. want to draw attention to one little nuance here, which is important to note. And um, it's, it's this. One of the big challenges is that when your doctors don't aren't responsive to the things that you might need to address, you can start to have these disparate connections where not where no one has a centralized sort of understanding of what you're doing and what's going on with your medications or or any other piece of your your treatment for your, your Parkinson's or other features of your health. So you really not only have to be courageous and share the things that you're you have questions about, you also have to make sure everybody that needs to know knows the things that you're doing. So uh, it's a real challenge to feel comfortable sharing all of the decisions you make. But I think it's really important to note that, you know, you have to know every doctor that needs to know. Because it's a real challenge, but you got to share it. You have to, but you have to remember every person that needs to know for your doctors. And that's oftentimes hard to do. Um, it's just, it's without having a centralized like healthcare system, it's so hard. It's so hard to share all the information to get everyone on board, to make sure they all know what's going on. Just even about your general health, not even talking. Not even talking about this, like that, that, that would be like near impossible, I think. Yeah. And and then we're back, we're full circle, right? And then we're talking about energy. So managing energy, manner, managing expectations. And, and as we progress with the disease and have more symptoms with the disease, it often gets more complex. And so there are more players and. Well, and, and, and the way, the way that Chris led into that, prior topic um yep. the lead the lead-in I have experience with which was I'm the primary I wouldn't say caretaker for my mother because she's at um an assisted living facility but I now handle all of her finances all of her medical appointments I'm sort of behind the scenes and mm -hmm. she has Parkinson's um in fact I think we probably both contracted it at the same time I'm about two steps behind her but she's 26 years older than I am she was diagnosed a couple of years after me because of my diagnosis. She was like, well, you know, what's going on? So anyway, um, when I go to Florida, I used to be able to multitask very easily, energetically, cognitively. I could juggle a lot of plates, but I can't anymore. And unfortunately, it worked out where my partner and I went to Florida and it was too much for me. And I asked him to leave. And so we have a pinky pact now that when I go to Florida, even though he loves Miami and he loves the beach, he doesn't come because I can't manage. I don't even want to say taking care because I don't take care of him, but I can't manage tending to multiple people in my life. And when I go to Florida, I go about once every four to six weeks. Um, I just go down and tend to my mother and it's just a, an agreement that we made because I can't manage the relationships anymore the way that I used to. And it puts him in a very bad position because he's going to get left behind because my mother is my primary focus. And it's terrible. <laughs> I, I hate actually it. completely relate to that. I feel like before I used to, whenever I had my kids, we would all go over to my parents' house several nights a week. And now I feel like I can handle one day. I can handle one day with all of them, but for the most part, if I have my kids, we're at home and it has to be just us because I get overwhelmed and overstimulated by all the things. So I have to pull that back and rein it in. 
So that I completely relate to that. Mm -hmm. And being honest about it, Robin, and communicating with him about it is, is, is in my opinion, all you can do. And um, those that love us and will help us navigate um, and have compassion about it as we navigate it. And it's going to change. And so, and it's going to change what my partner brings up with me too, is that we're both aging and we're both experiencing age-related normal stuff, you know, different attention span, different energy. And so he reminds me that not everything with me is Parkinson's because that's really easy to blame, right? Mm -hmm. So I try to remember that too, that, that, and as long as we open the door to communicate both ways, that seems to work pretty well for us. Not every time though, we miss and, and, um, we're trying to both have patience and compassion for both of us as we navigate it. And it's hard, you know, it's hard, but it's worth it to me. It's worth it to keep at it. So. Yeah. That goes back to what Brian was saying in my mind very early in this conversation. It's about um, just believing that it's worth taking the, making the effort. And that, that relates to whether it's, a relationship, whatever relationship you're talking about, whether it's your relationship with yourself or, uh, or your relationship to your partner, your kids, your dog. I think I heard a moment ago. Yeah. Um, we're getting close to the to the hour mark, and I want to get to one uh, fun question. But I, I'm I'm curious about the sort of bigger picture of like. Uh, this I shouldn't do this to us, but I'm going to the big, bigger picture of the sense of love of life, or or or, or mm -hmm. the sense of the the how we're doing overall in terms of thinking about. I don't know. I guess I was thinking about did I curse God when when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's? Did I blame a higher power? Am I did, did I react wildly? I don't think I did, but it it certainly did affect my perspective on how I felt about the world generally. And I'm wondering what we think about that, just our relationship to the world and how we fit in it and and whether it's scarier or, or less scary or how we act about- I'm more our... empathetic. It's giving me empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. happening. Um, dealing with uh, thinking about your question, Chris, and uh, how we view the world. And I was thinking about when Lily was uh, in hospice and it's like you can totally view the world as ugly and it's ripping you off and tearing you down. We never did that for a moment because we felt love all around us. We found gifts in every single day in all different kinds of ways. And I've continued that because it's, it's an existence that's really there. It's a challenge to look at it sometimes. It's a challenge to say, but there's this. But the greatest gift we have, I think, is being in the outdoors because that's where you feel it. That's where you feel the energy of all, I think. And it clears my mind. And that helps me look at things like I don't have hate for anybody. I don't despise people who've abandoned me. Um, I don't even know that I would say that they abandoned me so much as they just didn't have it for me. Um, it's more about finding what is good in each day and the gifts that we find keep that better side of ourselves from tearing down when we have all this to deal with. Well, I will say that and I've said this before, but Parkinson's gave me permission to live my bucket list now. And I really have been doing that. What's been interesting is that my Parkinson's has inspired other people. Once they find out I'm living my bucket list and not waiting go. until retirement, other people who don't have Parkinson's are like, oh, my God, I should do that. I'm like, yes, you totally should. <laughs> And so, I mean, I had a neurologist, neurologist number four, just looked at me after I got my conf confirmation diagnosis. And he said, live your best life now. Whatever you want to do, go do it. 
and that's what I've been doing. Yeah, that's a that's a perfect way to summarize and a very nice answer to the question uh, would be something like this, right? Make the most of it and take what do do what we can. We have a choice and every day. Every I choose it. Amen, Brian. Amen. Choose it every day. Yeah. And it, it, it's it's not easy. It's hard. There's a lot of things that I had a really tough morning this morning because I got frozen in the shower and then all these Parkinson symptoms are coming while they're trying to deal with the back symptoms and and I got overwhelmed. And they said, Do you want to go outside? That's why I was saying the outside thing. I got outside and I just started thinking of all the blessings I have of these people that care and these. So you just gotta find the perspective. It's there. You can choose to zoom in on that really sucks or okay, but this is really great and lift that up. And that is my survival tool. Even if you have to start small, even yeah. if you have to start small, making a, a list of three things you're grateful for. I come back to this a lot, write it on your notebook, jot it on your phone. If it's hard to change your perspective, don't expect to just wake up tomorrow and feel great. Start little and grow it. Um, and and I don't know, if we got there, you all can get there. I think once you start to do those three things that you're grateful for every day, you realize that there's a lot to be grateful for. Like I like to, I'm happy I get to, I get to watch every sunrise. So what? My meds don't, I don't sleep that well, but I, this is a positive thing out of it. I get to watch the sunrise in my living room. It's awesome every morning. So i garbage truck comes. I'm going back to my garbage truck. <laughs> I love garbage pickup day. So. It is very awesome. Um, but I, I get to I... be needed and positive. I think the same way. I think that meeting people that I've met, like you guys, being able to travel, being able to advocate. I've been presented with a lot of opportunities to help in ways that I wouldn't have if I didn't have Parkinson's. I often think of that like Parkinson's is trash, basically. But what would I be doing right now if I didn't have it? Like, it, I feel like it's brought so much to my life that is positive. I mean, aside from the trash of it, the people, the making a difference that it, it makes it a little bit easier to love the world all because of that empathy that you're talking about. We're leaving, Sorry, Christy. We're all leaving a positive impact, even though yeah. it's a trash disease. Well, and, and I think what, what you all bring up too is it's community. It's That's what lifts me up. Like today, I knew this was happening and I had all that hard stuff. I said, just make sure I get to that meeting. I have to be at that meeting because this lifts me up to see all of you to hear the challenges that we hear in the chat box and that we address we're all there supporting each other and that's the community that's the thing i found with parkinson's communities is all the bullshit goes away you meet people really real there's no pretenses no no pretense it's it is genuine selves and you make genuine friendships because we all understand each other. And that's the thing that community that we have is what's so important to us. And find that within your own city, state, world, whatever. But that's, as long as you have somebody you can be honest with, you're in a good place. You know, friends, honestly, on paper, I hated this topic. I thought it was terrible. Um, I just thought it was the worst. But honestly, being here for this hour, it's pretty it's been pretty cool i love you guys you're the best love you too thank love you, you Davis Kinney foundation for giving us yes. a forum to do this yes, yes. well thank thanks you. for being here with us everybody and and thanks for thanks for uh, all your time panelists and audience everybody thanks for being here and we'll look forward to seeing you next month uh i think the meetup is on the 21st of march next month and we'll we'll look forward to talking then and i, I think the topic for next month is going to be um probably something about the the way Parkinson's is depicted in the media. So keep your eyes out for um you can you can view a post we have actually. We'll put a link in the blog post when we publish it, which is just a an example of some stories about um just the way Parkinson's has been featured in recent media, including the the movie Still and um 
shrinking some other shows that you might watch in preparation for that meetup. But we'll talk about the effect that that has on our lives with Parkinson's next month. And that'll be March 21st. Uh, thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next month. Bye. Bye. Bye.